Well, guys, thank you so much for, for coming out tonight to uh, listen to me talk about painting, which is definitely one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, so I chose this, uh, this painting of, by Oscar Kokoschka, who's a, um, associated with Expressionism, which was a movement in Austria and Germany in the early 20th century. Um, and this is a painting of the, the Tuileries Gardens in Paris. Um, choosing this piece was very difficult for me. Um, you know, the Portland Art Museum is filled with work that I, that I constantly come back to as an artist. Um, and all these pieces from Emma Amos to Mills and Avery to Kenneth Nolan and um, Helen Frankenthaler, all um, of these artists give me insight and, and permission and encouragement to work in the way that I work today. But, um, but I'm gonna talk about this piece tonight after much deliberation. Um, and to describe this artist and his work, I, I kind of want to set the stage of his life a bit for you. Um, because to talk about his life is very much to talk about his work. Um, he was born in uh, what was Austria-Hungary to uh, parents who are not artists and who struggled to make ends meet. Um, as a kid, he only did well in the arts in school and spent most of his time reading classical literature. And um, this knowledge of the classics um, is often evident in his paintings, as he uses characters from myths to create his, a lot of allegorical works um, that were often emphatic political satires or poetic and tumultuous expressions of love um, and their subsequent trials. He studied at a university called the Kunstgewerbeschule in Vienna, um, and that was a very progressive arts university. Um, and his professors were leaders of the movement, was, which was called the Vienna Secession. Um, and to tell you a little bit about the Vienna Secession, at the time, this was the turn of century Vienna. Um, the Secession was led by uh, Gustav Klimt, and the movement objected to the prevailing conservatism at the time and was lauded with building the first building to showcase contemporary art in Vienna. Um, it was also meant to connect uh, Vienna with other international art movements and to take a stand against nationalism in art. Um, so these were Kokoschka's teachers. So he kind of began with rebellion from, from the get-go. Um, they were his roots where he started as an artist. Um, the Vienna Secession brought international contemporary works to Vienna, but uh, for the public to see and become familiar with. Um, in 1908, artists uh, surrounding Gustav Klimt organized the ex exhibition called Kunstschau, which is also kind of um, attributed to being the kind of trailblazer of the modern art movement in Vienna at the time. Um, but the Vienna Secession's main philosophical stance was one of freedom. They didn't have any aesthetic priorities or um, real kind of philosophical hierarchies, only freedom, and to kind of eschew history um, and the, uh, the academy. Um, and that was kind of an interesting and lofty goal that, that it really appealed to, Kukosh to Kukoshka. Um, so the vibe in Vienna at the turn of the century was one of a desire by the literati to overturn the traditionalism, traditional tradition of nationalism and history. It was a fraught place inhabited by figures as daunting and theoretically desperate, disparate <laughs> as Sigmund Freud, Adolf Hitler, and Leon Trotsky, pretty much the emblems of opposing ideals. Um, but even, even despite this very rebellious atmosphere, the work that Kokoschka exhibited in the Kunstschau got him dismissed from the university that he was attending at the time because it was, caused such an uproar. Um, he was a bit of a polymath. He wrote poetry and plays in addition to being an avid painter. Um, his first book of poetry was published in 1908, and he was also cited as being the author of the first expressionist drama titled Murder, the Hope of Women, <laughs> which when it debuted caused such a crazy uproar that um, the police were called. Kokoschka had shaved his head. All the, all the players had shaved their heads and were so dedicated to their performance that they left um, the, the performance bruised and bloodied. They, and it caused like a, a terrible uproar and um, the, kind of, uh, the, the kind of overarching themes of the work were ideas of the, what was called the female principle, um, an erotic power associated with an unconscious that can upset the patriarchal order. Some critics describe this as being in line with some of the rather misogynistic pseudoscience um, circulating in Vienna at the time. Um, 
that deemed that male rationale and spirituality was always um, upset by the more debased female bestiality, also known as the unconscious. So these were kind of ideas that were circulating in Vienna at the time. Um, but Kokoschka definitely um, expressed that this moral allegory was, uh, was, was not a reflection, was more of his reflection, wait, hold on one second. <laughs> uh, expressed that the play was not a moral allegory, but rather a reflection of his outra outrage at the existential malaise that gripped the conservative Viennese society at the time. Its themes, like much of his work, were sex and death, and um, um, the audience uh, threatened the playwright who was deemed a corrupter of youth. So this was Kokoschka's beginning. He was, it was only 1908, he was 22, I think, at the time. He was unafraid, he was passionate, he was restless, and he was outspoken. He was a frustrated humanist and a provocateur who believed that art, quote, art gives renewed hope as often as the world fails. And the existential malaise that caused his outrage as a youth morphed into the kind of full-blown expression, expressionist style that would essentially be kind of like an FU to uh, the fascist powers that led the European um, individualist, um, the European continent into two world wars. His work was moody and emotional and dramatic, as you can see. And, um, and yet he never really associated himself with any group, um, not truly with the expressionists, not even with groups that named themselves after him, which was like the Oskar Kokoschka Bund in Czechoslovakia in, in the 30s. Um, in 1915, which was 10 years before this was painted, he entered the First World War, volunteering to serve on the Eastern Front, and was wounded um, severely, and um, it took him many years to recover. He was discharged from the army with a label of mental instability. Um, and at this time, he was also involved with a woman named Alma Mahler, this very tumultuous love affair that he had with this woman who was the widow of Gustav Mahler. Um, and she, you know, kind of broke up with him, and, and he didn't ever really recover from it. He loved her for the rest of his life. Um, and if you've ever seen the painting, The Bride of the Wind, that's his painting with her in it. Um, and there's, if you remember any, any uh, college art history classes, um, they talk about a doll that he had fashioned in her likeness to kind of receive his affections, but um, it didn't really work, and he was very frustrated, and he destroyed the doll at a party. Um, anyway, so he was a, he was a, a, a wild man. <laughs> Um, he accepted a, a professorship in Dresden in 1919 when he was still kind of recovering from these injuries that he sustained in the First World War. And um, in the 20s, he traveled extensively. This painting was made in 1925, um, right between the two world wars. Um, and at this time, Paris was this eclectic uh, city with the energy of the World's Fair, which brought over 15,000 exhibitors to the city, um, displaying all of the latest and avant-garde ideas and their subsequent formal executions in art, architecture, and music. 16 million people passed through the city in those seven months, so Kokoschka was in kind of in his element, just soaking up all of this wonderful, vibrant um, influences. Um, and Kokoschka, in 1931, he returned to Vienna, um, but because of the Nazis' growing power, he fled uh, to Czechoslovakia. And in the 1937, the Nazis deemed his work degenerate, or entarte, in Tarte, I think. Um, Alfred Rosenberg was one of the Nazis' leading spokesmen for art and culture, and expanded the co concept of um, cultural Bolshevism, initially broached by Hitler and Mein Kampf. And according to this claim, all mo modern art was a communist Jewish conspiracy to undermine the beauty ideal of the Aryan race. Um, all manifestations of modern art were, were deemed this at the time, and they were, all the modern art was collected into this huge exhibition uh, which traveled most of Europe as, as kind of an emblem of what was not to be done. Um, um, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, expressionism also fell under this umbrella um, as degenerate art oriented because it celebrated uh, and expressed the experience of the individual as opposed to the ideals of the state. This current in art was extremely threatening to many as it questioned ways of life upheld thus far. This current was a rejection of authority and thus could not be tolerated by fascist entities looking to claim and maintain authoritarian regimes. The movement heralded the spirit 
as a valid, um, the expressionist movement heralded the spirit as a valid diviner and uh, entity of experience as it rebelled against both positivism, which was a movement that basically um, heralded empirical evidence and rationale as its, as kind of the law, and impressionism, so expressionism, rebelled against impressionism, impressionism, which you can see examples of in this actually this very room, which were supposed to be uh, evidence of nature, like the experience of nature. Um, so expressionism was really, really about the individual and the psyche of the individual. Um, let's see, it's associated with a sort of angst and was seen as a reaction to the dehumanization and industrialization of the modern age, especially with the, the rise of cities. And um, expressionist printmakers, uh, in order to reach larger audiences with their work, they turned to printmaking and um, were often motivated by social and political causes. So Kokoschka's work and a person were emblematic of all of these ideals, especially in terms of its intrinsic rebellion and utter focus on the idiosyncratic possibilities of visual language. So when I look at this piece, um, I'm, I look at it as a painter. Um, I think it's visually arresting, and it's deft and cleverly irreverent choices uh, that Kokoschka makes. Um, there are wanton human figures that you can see walking along the promenades, the trees, the rain, the wall facades, and the shadows of archways are kind of these virtuosic single marks. There's this humid atmosphere of the rainy Parisian afternoon, which is one color set against another. These choices, I think, um, as a painter, become ontological forces and metaphysical cones. To take them apart and consider them as languages to deal with what I deal with as a painter and to understand my concerns as an artist. Um, these marks are, are puzzle pieces that comprise an alphabet that give rise to a possible set of visual linguistics. Um, the forces that work here, I believe, are the pieces that are its marks. I believe the scene here to act primarily as a formal platform, a space of limits set, his, um, and above all, an excuse, really. Kokoschka uses the structure of these gardens uh, truly to paint his belief system. Um, this painting becomes the record of these moments, which is the inherent power, I believe, of oil painting, a medium I believe to be better at anything else than recording a moment, um, and to exhibit and witness the wildness in both providence and self-expression as rebellion in a time of fascism and burgeoning Nazism. I think that in this piece there's light. Um, Kokoschka makes rain and atmosphere without any coddling of the surface or pretension in his technique. It's raw and simple and yet somehow still sublime. Kokoschka believed it necessary um, to keep a foothold in the world um, in his pictures and therefore never made any purely abstract work. Um, yet in this piece, I don't see the buildings or the gardens um, as motivations for the picture. I see the paint as symbol and signifier, as mythic female principled stuff that is wet and uncouth and endlessly telling a narrative unto itself. Um, Kokoschka's need to ground this work in the real world was a way of holding on to you as a viewer. It was his, his belief that the figurative world was the key to reaching a viewer who might be suspicious of these kind of pictures. And these concerns are the concerns of image makers. Um, they speak to a small niche of people that make images who also care about images and perhaps is also the fate of all poets. Um, in relation to Kokoschka's choices to involve the real world, I believe um, at this juncture of images and image making, that I make my work um, as a reprieve from the assumptions of the real in order to foster a return to looking and a return to thinking. I make images that are made of paint and they nod to paint and its history in the hope that opting out of images and opting in simultaneously is still an option. Um, and please don't misunderstand me. <laughs> I, I staunchly believe in the power of images that are figurative and narrative and directly based in the real world. I've made those images, and I often think that I will make them again. Um, and yet at this moment in, in time, I, I think that the volume of incoming images into our collective field of vision is so great that too often the brain allows itself to categorize the image's thingness without looking at how, the how of its making 
and the questioning and the significance and symbolism of these choices. Even as I speak, I recognize that these are, are very old ideas. To make an abstraction that is linguistic and subversive and that is not the abstraction of the past, but the abstraction of the now is a process, often one that is searching and often one that is failing, but the one that I personally continue to strive for. Um, there are visual hierarchies that I have inherited that I attempt to upend but give credence to and address in so doing. And I could never claim um, the, them as my own invention, but nod to, as one nods to a lineage steeped in centuries of image making and of painting. Um, the arts and sciences are essentially all a collective body that stands on the backs of our colleagues and our heroes, both past and present. This is all to say, though, that the image can sometimes stand in the way or be in a stand-in for what the artist is truly saying. To opt out of an image to me is uh, just as a political act as it was Kokoschka's choice to opt in to paint his tormented figures or landscapes. Um, but Kokoschka's work walks both lines. In a landscaped garden, in a storm-addled ocean, uh, in a puffily bejowled face, or the tense negative space between lovers. Uh, he addresses subjects as disparate as fascism, abortion, hypocrisy, longing, sex, death, violence, tyranny, apathy, and disgust. And he was using paint to do this. This is why he is one of my heroes. Um, he could wield this miasmic goo of my chosen medium with a virtuosity while simultaneously infusing it with a provocative power of a rebellious and evocative soothsayer, which brings us to now. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm giving this talk tonight uh, because I believe that history is a fantastic teacher, and um, in my opinion, particularly the history of image making. The way images were and are currently made, used, and distributed are all indicators of a societal temperature. Uh, a knowledge of imagistic history is knowledge of a poetic people's history, a visual record of voice in the zeitgeist of rebellion, the moment when fevered shifts were imminent and necessary and people felt compelled to rise up and street, speak truth to power. We can unpack a time and a place in this history and find truths that are not recorded in writing and continue to give insight long after their makers are dead and gone, like Kokoschka. So in this moment, history is repeating itself. The fascism that Kokoschka uh, witnessed and spoke out against as an artist has re resurfaced here in this country, and the subjects, the outrage, and the nuance with which he addressed and expressed them are as important as ever. This talk is a call to seeing. Um, it is our job as artists and ministers of culture to keep a close eye on the rise of fascism in power and make certain to speak in the work that we do and call out what it is we see. The experience of art is the chance to see the way another sees. This is a boon to consciousness and to progress. Within art, there are the voices and visions of that that is not the self but the other, the outraged, the oppressed, and the silenced. And uh, I believe that seeing is the simple act of paying attention. Yeah, so um, that's what I have to say about this painting, why I believe in painting, I believe in the history of painting and image making. Um, does anyone have any questions? <laughs> Hi. I was really uh, arrested by your short comment that oil paint is, is the best medium for capturing a moment, so I would like you to explain why. Um, I, I believe that um, a lot of people think that photography is a, the, one of the best ways of recording a moment, but I still believe that a, photog a photograph is a, a picture that's been made. It chooses where to begin and end, and it's very much the kind of seer that is creating this image. But with an oil paint, you, the second you touch it, it records exactly that moment. And it records the speed of a line, it records the slowness of a line, it records violence or uh, frustration or languid, slow, thick, damned rivers. You know, it can do all of that. And so I, I think that that is the best, it's much more honest, I think, so. But it's different than other forms of painting. Yes, yes, I mean, I, I know that, that uh, oil paint can also 
record, a, you know, a form a, in space, very, very silkily, and, but that's kind of not what I'm talking about in terms of it being the recorder of a moment. Um, it's, it's very versatile stuff. It can do kind of anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in oil painting, you can have layers and layers and layers see through them and you can create a lot of depth mm -hmm. that you can't with colors. It's true. Yeah. See how, how is your work reflected with, against this or with this? Well, I, I think that, I mean, as I was saying a, a little bit in, in the talk, is that I don't really think that this scene in particular is what Kokoschka was really meaning to, was really important to him. I think that he is really kind of an existential painter, especially with, in this particular work. Um, and so that's, I'm also an existential painter, but while he opts into the image, I opt out of the image on, in, a, in a way to create a subversion and um, find a, another kind of abstract language of the now, which is like maybe impossible but it's, it's the, what I do. And, and I feel like expressionism was the beginning of a time when paint was used to kind of express that angst in the paint itself. And I believe very much in the power of that paint to, to be able to do that. So um, that's how I, I feel in it, like a kinship to him in that way. You made a comment in, as you were speaking about how we're bombarded with images that, that, that create, uh, cause us to categorize. Mm -hmm. Are you talking about TV and internet and that yeah. That yes. Know. Yeah. And 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 just the image, like as a figure, figurative image unto itself. I think it's easy for the brain to categorize things very quickly as the thing that it is, rather than seeing the way that it's made. Um, and I think that painting can like make you kind of yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I'm represented by National on Division. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. I was just going to say um, that uh, it, it, you're expressing your re reaction to the moment in oil paint mm -hmm. rather than you're actually recording the moment. Mm -hmm. Or is there some sort of intermediate step between you and what you capture? Um, I think the intermediate step is like kind of like deconstructing my own neuroses <laughs> so that I can pay attention enough to what is happening in front of me and know that sometimes it's something that I shouldn't be so in control of. Um, you mentioned photography is not maybe not the most perfect way, and that is, that is totally correct. Yeah. But well. I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> I don't think I don't think photography is direct at all. I think it's a complete construction, honestly. <laughs> um, yeah. And if you ever taken a picture and tried to take a picture and, and really wanted to capture something and then looked at the photograph afterwards and been like that didn't look or feel or anything like where I was at that time and space. <laughs> I can tell you're not buying it, but. <laughs> Do you paint abstract? Yes, I do. And how do you, I don't know how to put the question, but what do you think of when you are looking at the canvas and you want to abstract something? I mean, abstraction is taking something from the concrete and abstracting it to your vision. Well, pure abstraction is not that. It is just and the abstract form being a language unto themselves. So that's kind of what I'm interested in. And it's, it's hard because it feels like, is the nothingness something? But I believe that it is. Yeah. So that's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> that's what I do with my life. <laughs> You're trying to paint nothing. <laughs> well, but, but not nothing, but not nothing. More of like an existential state of yeah. existence yeah. that is not something. Uh -huh. Is that, if that makes sense? Yeah. Okay. Your question, I guess what I was thinking about is as you're doing that abstraction, mm -hmm. is there also, is there a composition? Are you thinking, and how do you build it from the canvas from there? Are you starting with maybe a sketch of something, or is it all just translating from your head to that? And I mean, 
what's the process? Well, well, I mean, I do a lot of different, I mean, a lot of different processes. Sometimes I, I haven't, like, I mean, most of the time I will start with a sketch or an idea, but it always changes once I start to work on the thing and the thing becomes something else entirely. And that's true, and then that becomes like the kind of very arresting and engaging process of painting where you're finding something that was probably, in my experience, much better than my ideal ever was. Um, and I can listen to something that is like, that is happening and is, that is more interesting and, um, and, and farther into to where I want to go. Then I, I, it's done. I mean, I'm curious to know when do you when do you put the paintbrush down and say, okay, this is it's a little bit of a contradiction, I think, in a way. I mean, I, I struggle yeah. with that myself. to go, okay, the idea of this abstraction is very um, uh, such an unfinished idea. I think. Yeah, yeah. I think I think there is like a level of tension that I'm looking for in the in the work. A level of tension. A level of um, seduction. A level of um, and of course, like I, I, I do, I'm not working in a vacuum. I'm like educated. I have a lineage of all these people on my shoulders, which is what I was trying to say is that I could never claim to create a hierarchy that I invented because I definitely didn't. I'm just working out of things that I know that have been given me the permission to go to the next thing that is closer to the truth of now. Um, yeah. So that would be part, I guess, mastering the, the, the material. Yes, uh, which took a very, and it's taking a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Another question. Was there anything surprising to you about doing this process of learning and focusing on this particular painting? Yes, I think, I think that I didn't even think of, that I had such a deep relationship with this painter. I mean, I lo always loved his work, and I... And he's a, an emblem of expressionism, even though he never associated himself with it. He was never a part of a group of expressionists like De Brucke or um, Der Blau writer. Like he never was part of those guys who were working out of Munich and, and had all these philosophies. And were like, we are the theosophists. We, we believe in, in, this, in the spirituality. That's why we're doing this. Or we believe in surrealism or Dada or all these amazing things that were happening at that time. He really was just kind of working on his own. And... Um, was just constantly um, outraged by what he saw in society. I mean, he had to fl flee all over Europe to escape persecution from the Nazis and, um, and was kind of appalled, I think, endlessly at not only the apathy that he saw in, in society, but in politicians that were doing nothing, you know, the Allied powers that took so long to get to World War II. Like, all of these things were just constantly the fodder for these kind of incredibly... Um, emotional allegories that he was making. So um, I, I find that very impressive. And um, when did yeah. he die? Uh, 1980. Yeah. yeah. In Switzerland. In Czechoslovakia? Switzerland. He was living. Yeah. Oh, I'm yeah. In Czechoslovakia. Oh, wow. And I went to the Nazis. Oh, my God. It's very good. His feeling is very familiar. Wow. Do you do you relate? I mean, in in a way that you feel like it captured a t in the zeitgeist or a time. No, you know, bad memories are better left alone. Okay. You yeah. Know, it's it's just something you have to you have to learn to give away, just give up. How should I say? Let go. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's it's a, you remember it. Doesn't hurt. Yeah. Wow. It just makes you mad. Makes you mad. Yeah. I'm getting this started. Yeah. <laughs> I never even had a red dress in my life. <laughs> wow. As you look through his uh, paintings, through his career and his life, did you notice any visible changes in? in how he painted, or um, was it pretty? I, I think, um, I mean, when, when he was a kid, he, he definitely made kind of awkward drawings of humans. He didn't ever, he didn't ever know the right way to paint. Um, but I think that what I did notice when I look through his work in terms of a, a linear progress is very much a, a facility with 
the, the paint itself and keeping colors separate to do what he wanted to do. I mean, that, that's, I definitely noticed that for sure. And so this, in that regard, is, is kind of an earlier painting, maybe a little bit more crude, a little less um, refined, which is also maybe why it appeals to me. <laughs> so I think you were saying that part of um, his expression was a social commentary on mm -hmm. what was happening at that time. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm curious to know what your social commentary is through your art during these times because you, I think, drew a correlation between then and now. Well, I mean, it's it's very hard stake to claim um, that abstract painting, you know, has a power, especially as an artist. I think that's like a huge claim, I think. Um, but then you have people that maybe see your work and you feel kind of like a priest in a confession booth. You know, you're like, I did not, I, in a way, I did not warrant this confession that you're telling me that was your experience with this work, but you're, you're telling this very personal thing to me, um, which is somewhat gratifying and also somewhat, like, insane feeling. Um, but I, I do think that, um, that, I mean, I could, it's very hard for me to say, my work could do the thing that I wanted it to do, which would be to upend a, a way of, of looking or seeing. Um, I, I could never make that claim. I, I just don't think it would be true. Um, but I do think that making images and looking at images and paying attention to images and paying attention to what we're seeing is incredibly important. <laughs> and so by doing that tangentially, I'm somehow fighting the warmongers, <laughs> but I don't think that I could say that a singular work that I made, maybe I'm just being self-deprecating. I mean, but I, I don't, I could never, I don't think I could Let say that. Let me ask you a different way. Okay. You look at your body of work, can you, you look at it and go, I can see what was happening politically at that time, and it, it really shaped kind of the type of work that I was doing? I, um, yeah, <laughs> I do. I do, actually. I do. I think that there's, uh, especially being a, a female artist, I think there's a lot of anger and outrage and like, um, and kind of like a desire to let it all hang out and also make a stand and say, this is, I'm going to do this and I'm going to stand next to it and say, this is enough and this is what I meant to do, and this is what I meant to say, and to stand next to that in relation to a lot of things that were happening at certain times um, in the country, yeah. Do you think because you are young and you can react to those people, things, and then as you get older and older, when you let go and let go, you start painting flowers? <laughs> <laughs> I think that painting flowers is very political. I think that that is, that is a, also an answer. Yes, I do. I think that that... That's where I want that. But, but I think that, I think that, a, that is, a, a, the, the, you know, the, we need a respite from all this madness, yes, you know? Yes, exactly. <laughs> it, 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 that's exactly what it is. Yeah, and that is, that's a stance to take, you know? And it's one that, it, that functions for, for you and for who, whoever looks at it, I think. So... Anyone? Do you think that your sources of inspiration are more in one genre than the other, something that you read, or someplace that you travel to, or people that you meet, or conversations that you have, or it's just like anything? It's kind of all of it. Just the stuff that moves you. You know, and I think that it can be all of those things. But I do think that you notice a theme sometimes in those conversations and in the that maybe that song or that poetry or um, or other works of art that are your kind of like um, your kind of instigators so yeah I think that, that, that inspiration comes from everywhere but there there are certain themes I think among them and so how do you do you when you title your works mm. are they very you know like abstract one two three or no. do you relate it to really what your inspiration was at that time? No, I try to mimic the language like I do the painting. So I want the juxtaposition of words to kind of like cause a little bit of tension and unrest and, um, and kind of throw a wrench in the engine and, 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 and a, in a very formal way. So, um, 
if I, if I make a title that is an imperative, for example, like do this thing, I think that that's interesting in my like nerdy, you know, art nerd linguistic juxtaposition formal sense. I think that that's really exciting the same way that if I put two, two um, you know, colors that vibrate like this right in the corner of the painting and just leave it alone, leave it there let's see, and just let it be that it says the same thing as the, as the title. <laughs> So. I hate to hog the conversation. No. I'm sorry. But okay, so when you paint something, you're trying to make a statement. I don't. As opposed to making a pretty picture. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to instigate. Um, I'm trying to. I, I think also, I, I really believe that the viewer for me is just as important as the, the work itself. So I want that to be kind of a. Yeah, yeah, I don't want to, I'm not, I'm not trying to knock anybody over the head and say, think this way, you know, um, I just kind of want to like, poke you in a, in a sensual way, <laughs> which is, it sounds really gross, uh, um, you know what I mean, you guys know what I mean. Um. <laughs> Um, I think I'm not trying to communicate something specific to my audience. I'm not trying to, I mean, I tangentially, but not like, not like in a sentence, but more of an experience through, through looking and through seeing, which again brings me back to this way of looking at painting and images, is that I, I really think that um, I'm trying to just make a new way to make a picture that is interesting and that embodies the kind of ideas that I, of what I think that paint can do as a medium, um, which is like sensuous and, and immediate and the recorder of a moment and all of those things. And also compositionally and, and color choice wise, all of these things kind of mix together and become, become an experience. Um, my favorite kind of works of art are, are pieces that I, I don't, I'm not necessarily going to be like, I got it, I know exactly what they wanted to tell me, and that's why I, I feel really like I can just go home and sleep at night. I kind of want to be taken on this incredibly intoxicating walk and maybe not even know where I'm going, but that the elements that were, are, are in play are kind of very visceral and powerful, and, um, and that is, that's honest, I think. I think that's honest, you know. Art education and history to experience those feelings? Or is that something just a general audience could also do? I think that, that um, I think it's just in a contemporary art setting, um, I think that it's a combination of those things. I think, though, that, um, you know, the only way you can really kind of understand contemporary work is to look at it a ton because there's no codified quantifiers for a, lang a, a one language that we're all speaking at, at this time. So you kind of look and say, what is the artist giving me? And what am I getting from this? And you say that, and you think about it for years and years and years and years. <laughs> and then you, um, you, get, you get kind of like your sea legs a little bit in terms of looking. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but I have to say that I, what I find very interesting in this piece is that the most architecturally represented is that rich I hear mm -hmm. next to that long red. Mm -hmm. And I uh, don't really know Paris that well. I was just kind of curious whether that's really a building that he made abstract, or, I mean, whether that really exists in, in space. That, I don't know, in some ways it looks like a beer bottle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't, does, I mean, at the end, it, in the end of the day, like, you know that he maybe meant a building, but maybe he wanted you to see a beer bottle. 
But I think it's kind of like that's where you come into the work um, and why the work is like forever kind of this interesting thing. Um, and why it's important, I think, to look at art in general is because we're not all supposed to think one thing. I was just reading Da Vinci's uh, article on perspective, and this is just a prime example of what he. I wonder if he read it and <laughs> was doing it. You know how you put that. And yeah. You know, because the vanishing point and all of that, yeah. and how everything forward is more in focus, and then, then the colors change as yeah. you go further and further away. And then it just describes that article. Yeah, I mean, he, he does. He creates this gorgeous space. Like, there's atmosphere in this painting. There's the weather. You can feel it's kind of humid maybe that day. And, like, yeah, it's incredible. Well, thank you guys for coming out and listening to me talk. <laughs>